You know, this presentation isn't just about you and I. And the reason I stand and speak the way I do is not to be offensive, but I have concerns not only for the current day medical business profession and its patients, but I have concern for the future. And these young men and my other three grandchildren, they represent the future. So if there's anything, and I ask you to join me, anything we can do to give them a better future, I think we ought to try. I think it's worth it. And one of the issues we ought to get fixed is the food, and that's what I'm going to talk to you about now. Uh, I was asked to talk about diabetes, and that's fine, because I take care of a lot of diabetics. Oh, you know the disclosure part. These are all the things I do for fun and also to make a living, which is run the McDougall program. We have the Dr. McDougall's Right Foods, Adventure Trips, and a few best-selling books. So diabetes, what causes diabetes? Well, there are two kinds of diabetes, so to speak. There's one where the pancreas is injured. That is the consequence most commonly of consuming cow's milk protein. You develop an autoimmune reaction that destroys the pancreas through a process called molecular mimicry. It doesn't have to be just in a child. Half the people who get type 1 diabetes are over the age of 18. The pancreas is destroyed. And then there's type 2 diabetes, which is a consequence of obesity. It's a normal adaptation to eating rich food. A type 2 diabetic has lots of insulin in their body. In fact, they have as much insulin and sometimes twice as much insulin as somebody without diabetes. And then there's something in between that I take care of all the time that confuses people, and that's referred to as type 1 and a half diabetes. And these are people that come to see me who have uh, <clears throat> elevated blood sugars, but they're not so bad that they're in ketoacidosis. They're usually trim. The pancreas is working, but not fully. Enough, producing enough insulin to keep them out of ketoacidosis, but not enough insulin to make them normal, and that's type one and a half. Type two diabetes, which is the type that's due to obesity, is 100% curable. Type one and a half, hmm, you know, you can help them a lot, but they may need some insulin. And of course, type one diabetics always need supplemental insulin. So I hope those categories are clear enough for you. Type 2, secondary to obesity, 100% curable. Type 1, secondary to an autoimmune reaction, pancreas is gone. Then there's a spectrum in between that we'll call type 1 and a half. They may need some medication. Regardless, all these categories of diabetics need good nutrition. Type 2 diabetes is a consequence of being overweight. Well, that's plain and simple it. You cannot be a type 2 diabetic without being fat or obese. It just doesn't happen. Type 2 diabetes is a normal adaptation of the body. The body's just trying to survive. What happens under normal circumstances that people respond usually to excess calories is they'll eat excess calories, say, in the spring or the summer, and then the fall comes along and they've stored a few excess calories to get through the winter, maybe an extra 20, 30, 40 pounds of fat to get through the winter, that's normal. And then they stop storing so much fat because it would be a disadvantage to store more fat than say 20, 30, 40, 50 pounds. The body would say that's anti-survival. So what happens is the body develops insulin resistance, just a normal adaptation. And that insulin resistance occurs at all different levels in the body. But regardless, the body develops insulin resistance as a consequence, it doesn't store as much fat. Insulin is what forces fat into fat cells. The body says, that's enough, 40, 50, 60 pounds, you've stored enough. Now we'll develop insulin resistance. As a result, you don't store so much fat in the body, and also your blood sugar goes up. And that's how you develop type 2 diabetes. Now, I see patients who may surprise you, and you see these people too. <clears throat> They're not 60 pounds overweight, they're 600 pounds overweight. I mean, some of these people you have to pick them up with a forklift to bring them to the hospital. And when you check these very big people, you're surprised. I know you're surprised. I used to be surprised. You're surprised even though they're massively obese. Three, four, five, six hundred pounds overweight, they have no diabetes. They have no high blood pressure, they have no high cholesterol, and their arteries are pretty darn clear. They're just huge. I mean, the joints are bad. What happened in that case? 
Well, that subset of people does not develop insulin resistance. The insulin just keeps working and working and working on stuff and fat into fat cells. Insulin resistance is a normal survival mechanism the human being uses so it doesn't become massively obese. And we call it diabetes or type 2 diabetes. That's how you get it. It's not a disease. It's normal adaptation. <clears throat> now, type 2 diabetes is 100% curable. Yes, it is. How do we know that? Well, thanks to the surgeons who do bariatric surgery. They take and they uh, cut parts of people's intestines out or put bands around their stomachs. And the consequence is these massively or moderately overweight people, they lose weight and they cure their type 2 diabetes. 70 to 80% of the time their diabetes is cured just by weight loss. I contend if it's truly type 2 diabetic, not type 1 and a half, that they are cured 100% of the time. So that's the current method of treatment of type 2 diabetics these days, a very popular one, and that is to cause them to lose weight by bariatric surgery. That's an accepted mode. That gets the New England Journal of Medicine's attention. Can you consider what the professions of medicine could do in terms of treating diabetes if it applied its various skills? Just think of the different, the different segments of the medical community that could treat type 2 diabetes. For example, I remember the day when they used to wire people's teeth together for weight loss. You can cure type 2 diabetes as a dentist. Yes, you can. You can cure type 2 diabetes as an oncologist. You just give them massive chemotherapy, make them so sick they can't eat, and guess what? You cure their type 2 diabetes. Or a neurosurgeon could do it. They could do a frontal lobotomy, cause them not to eat. You could cure type 2 diabetes. Or let's not leave out the general surgeons. They could do bilateral lower extremity amputations so the diabetic couldn't get to the refrigerator and wouldn't cure them. What do you think, guys? Well, that's where medicine goes in curing type 2 diabetes. All right. I think there's a better way, and that's a high-carbohydrate diet. High-carbohydrate diet, what we're talking about is a diet based on starch. It's absolutely crucial you get this part, otherwise you're going to fail. You cannot treat your patients, you can't treat yourself unless you get the starch part right. Starch, starch-based diet. It has to be based on rice, corn, potatoes, breads, pastas, beans, peas, lentils, sweet potatoes, because if it isn't, then you will starve to death. You'll be living on green and yellow vegetables, like broccoli and cabbage and sprouts and kale. And you wonder why doesn't this work? Well, because you can't get enough calories on it. Or you'll get desperate after that and you'll say, well, I do need calories. You'll start eating nuts and seeds. And then you end up uh, a fat vegan. Not good. You have to get the starch part right. Starch-centered diet is what you're looking for. And starch-centered diets have what been the diets of human beings throughout all of recordable history. Like the Mayans and Aztecs were known as the people of the corn. That's a civil, those are civilizations that lived eight to 1,300 years on basically corn. The American Indian uh, from Peru, it was uh, potatoes. The Middle East, wheat and barley. The Far East, rice. All populations, all populations have lived on starch-based diets throughout all of recordable human history if they were large, successful populations. There are some extremes in the environment, like the Inuit Eskimo that didn't live on a starch-based diet. But those are small, primitive civilizations. All large, successful populations have lived on starch-based diets. But that changed. That changed with the Industrial Revolution. It changed with the harnessing of fossil fuels. And as a consequence, we've abandoned that starch-based diet, and instead we've eaten a diet with lots of meat. And worldwide, you see this. In various countries worldwide, the meat consumption has gone up tremendously, and dairy consumption over the last 50 to 75 years. And also, uh, the same geographic picture gives you a similar picture of the obesity rate worldwide. Countries where people are rich, eat lots of meat and dairy, are countries that have lots of fat people. And fat people have diabetes. Look at, look at China. What happened to China? This is good. This was part, just reported in the, New England, or the Journal of the American Medical Association. 
they looked at uh, the prevalence of diabetes. 12% of the population in China has diabetes. Half of them are pre-diabetic. Now, how did that happen? Well, 30 years ago, when 90% of their diet was rice, fewer than 1% had obesity or diabetes. What happened 30 years? You know, they gave up the starch. That's what happened. And they started eating the meat and the dairy. All right, sugar is good for blood sugar. Counterintuitive, right? Well, except that's what the science solidly says. If sugar is good for blood sugar, yes, it does. Well, I understand when you eat, your blood sugar goes up because it's supposed to go up. That's why you eat, to get calories. Studies uh, on this subject began in the uh, early 1900s. For example, a guy named Shirley Sweeney, he did a study on his medical students, always good for experiments, medical students. He took his medical students and he fed them a diet, high carbohydrate for, for two days and then tested their glucose tolerance. And they all tested non-diabetic. Lots of, lots of, you know, I mean, candy and sugar and pastry and white bread and potatoes, all the carbohydrates, simple and complex, he wanted to feed these students and they're all normal. Yeah. And he fed them a high-protein diet, and their sugars went up a little bit. And then he fed a, a high-fat diet, and they all turned diabetic. Some severely diabetic. And in 1920, Shirley Swinney reported that. And it's still true today. Nothing's changed. Uh, here's uh, one student on a high-fat and a high-carbohydrate diet. You see the high blood sugars on a high-fat diet. I think you talked about that. In this conference already, how fat it is to diabetes. Here's the classic work, a guy named Hemsworth. Anybody who's going to talk about diet and diabetes has to know Hemsworth's work. He published the classic study in 1940 in the British Medical Journal where he took patients, he either fed them a high sugar diet, high carbohydrate, or he fed them a high fat diet. On a high fat diet, they became diabetic. Look at that in the 1940s, but nobody seems to know it today. Uh, this is from uh, Brunzel, University of Washington. <clears throat> What he did is he took patients, he put them on a synthetic diet of uh, maltose and dextrins, simple sugars. He made 45% of the diet sugar, and then he doubled it to 85% sugar. And guess what? Every aspect of diabetes became better. Fasting blood sugars, oral glucose tolerance tests, 24-hour sugars, insulin, everything became better. Brunzel did that and published it in 1971. Nothing's changed. He said that sugar actually makes insulin work better. Yes, he did. <clears throat> a more recent study that uh, you probably enjoy, because it all says the same. Nothing changes in terms of true science. This was published in Diabetes Care. They took type 1 diabetics, and they dramatically increased their sugar intake, and their insulin needs decreased by 30%. You see, sugar makes insulin work better. It happens to do, to do with, if you want to study it further, the molecular structure of insulin and how it fits in with sugar. There's no controversy in this. <clears throat> Dr. Joslin of the famous Joslin Clinic, he knew this. He said in 1927, <clears throat> he says, I believe the chief cause of premature atherosclerosis and diabetes, save for advancing age, is an excess of fat. An excess of fat in the body, obesity, an excess of fat in the diet, and an excess of fat in the blood. With an excess of fat, diabetes begins, and from an excess of fat, diabetics die, formerly of coma and recently of atherosclerosis. Joslin knew this. Nathan Pritty had treated patients uh, in the 70s and 80s with a diet high in starch, vegetables and fruits, virtually no meat and dairy. And his diabetics, they got well and stopped their medication. This is not controversial science. James Anderson at the University of Kentucky did it too, and he published it. It always happens. Type 2 diabetics are 100% curable with a good diet and weight loss, or even just with weight loss. But let's add a good diet. Neil Bernard did the same thing. And this guy, I tell you, we have so much to learn from Walter Kepner at uh, Duke University. He was at Duke University for a long time. Came there in 1934, started the rice diet in 1939. He served patients a diet that was 93% carbohydrate, called the rice diet. Sometimes that diet was half simple sugar. White rice, half simple sugar. He had to make it half simple sugar because the protein content of rice was so high in suffering patients. 
So he added sugar to cut the protein content down to make it easier on the kidneys and the hearts of his patients who were severely ill. It's an amazing diet. You need to know, know about Kepner's work. Kepner supported Duke University for three decades financially with the rice diet. So Kepner's work, which is well published, uh, talks about using a diet that's made of rice, happens to be white rice, not ideal, but it worked. Rice, table sugar, fruit juice was his basic diet. It was 93% carbohydrate. And people lost weight. It was published in the Archives of Internal Medicine as a way to treat massive obesity rather than bariatric surgery. Uh, the rice diet was shown to treat diabetic retinopathy, which we treat with laser therapy these days, which should be of great concern to you who are practicing physicians, especially when you realize a low-fat diet will reverse diabetic retinopathy. The uh, fundoscopic examination on the left, you see exudates and hemorrhages in this type, this diabetic. And then he's, this diabetic is put on the rice diet. And you see the other slide of the fundus. You see resolution of the exudates and hemorrhage. It reverses diabetic retinopathy. Uh, how many patients are told that? I doubt any. And Van Eck, he showed the same thing. Again, published uh, several decades ago. I know this information has not gone a long ways in terms of getting to students. And maybe some of you know the reason why. But this has been confirmed. You just take a diabetic with terrible eye, uh, eye damage. And by the way, what you see in the eye is reflected in the rest of the body, too. The same thing's happening in the kidneys and the muscles and the heart and all other tissues. You just can see it in the eye and observe it. Reversal of diabetic retinopathy because you're reversing the disease by taking the animal foods and the oils out and replacing it with sugar. Well, this patient with severe kidney disease, and not a problem with uh, diabetics, right? <laughs> kidney problems. And you can uh, slow or reverse diabetic kidney disease. We've known that for 100 years, all kinds of kidney disease with a healthy diet, high sugar, low protein. Everybody knows this. The Kepner took care of very severely ill patients. Reversed coronary insufficiency. We talk about reversing artery disease and denormation, cardiovascular, and have been published a lot of that recently. But Walter Kepner do this. These are EKGs. And the first uh, set of EKGs shows ischemia based on ST depressions. And then the follow-up shows reversal of ST depressions. In other words, reversal of coronary insufficiency was proved by Kepner on the rice diet. People with terrible heart failure, put them on the rice diet, the hearts would shrink often down to normal size, in about half the cases. It treats severe hypertension with the rice diet. That's probably one of the things it became most famous for. You want to learn more about Walter Kempner, there's a biography about him. He's a man that every doctor should be taught about. He's probably the most important person, medical person in my, uh, in my career. He's a man whose shoulders I stand upon a lot. Because not only did he show me the effectiveness of diet, he showed me how simple a diet could be and be nutritionally adequate. White rice and simple sugar provided all the protein that a patient needed. All right, I run a residential program in Santa Rosa, California. We feed people a starch-based diet that has no animal products in it and no oils. It's based on starch, rice, corn, potatoes, beans, peas, lentils, things like oatmeal for breakfast, hash brown potatoes. For lunch, we have soups like bean, pea, lentil soup. For a dinner, we'll have things like bean burritos, spaghetti and marinara sauce, mushu vegetables, over rice, bean enchiladas. That's the kind of things you folks ate today. And as a result, what we have, and this is on 1,615 people the data I've showed you right now, over seven days, the average weight loss in women is 3.1 pounds, and men it's 3.6 pounds, and four, unrestricted eating. No portion control. Cholesterol drops, 23 points, no medication changes in seven days, just with diet. Tremendous drops in blood pressure. We get almost everybody off blood pressure pills, and their blood pressures drop profoundly. Overall, the drop is 8 over 4 millimeters of mercury. If they have severe high blood pressure, it's even greater. And their medications are stopped. Diabetics, all type 2 diabetics. I, when I meet a type 2 diabetic at clinic, and I'm sure, I'm confident they're type 2 diabetics. It's, it's a guessing game, so to speak. <clears throat> but I'll meet somebody, and I meet 
Well, I take care of 60 people every program myself personally. But somebody will come up and they'll say, I have diabetes and I'm on 140 units of insulin or, you know, three diabetic pills and 80 units of insulin. If I'm confident, and I've been doing this for almost 40 years, if I'm confident they're type 2 diabetic, what I say to them is stop the medication right now. 140, 100 units, 80 units of insulin, right now. If I'm not sure, I stop all their pills anyways. Those things are dangerous. And I'll cut their insulin maybe by a third or two-thirds. That's what a good doctor would do, I think. These medications are harmful to patients. Anyway, we do that and change their diet and check their blood sugars, and they do really well. Uh, I, we just uh, finished a study at Oregon Health and Science University. It was independent of analysis of our research. Uh, data was collected and uh, analyzed and is being published right now by Oregon Health Science University on our patients in Santa Rosa. It was a study directed at uh, multiple sclerosis and diet. There's some very positive things coming out of it. Didn't turn out as ideal as I thought, but all I had was three quarters of a million dollars. Uh, but I had what I should have had, which is the amount of money you spend on licensing a drug. I could have probably gone a lot of further, but at least we published this. We showed that people would follow this kind of diet permanently by doing careful food frequency evaluations. Yes, we did. All independent of us, done by Oregon Health Science University. Over a year-long period of time, the average fat intake in patients compared to a control group dropped from 40% to 15%. In other words, dramatic changes. They analyzed the patients, and depending upon how they looked at it, 60 and more percent of the patients followed the diet 100%. Uh, weight losses, uh, average weight loss, if you include everybody, is a 10-pound permanent weight loss at the end of the year. And if you just took a couple of people out that plain and simple said they didn't follow the diet compared to the control group, the average weight loss was 20 pounds. That's permanent change. <clears throat> drop in lipids, uh, the control group showed a six-point drop in total cholesterol, and uh, the intervention group showed almost a 20-point drop in total cholesterol, maintained over a year. Anyway, this is what I do. I take care of patients, feed them a starch-based diet. You know, you hear the Ginny Craig uh, commercials or Weight Watchers, they say this is the best case scenario. Don't expect these results. Well, I'm here to tell you, if you do this, you should expect these results because it's going to happen. These are typical people we take care of. And I'll show you, these people have been eating well for 5, 10, 15, 20 years because they finally figured it out. They finally figured out what the problem is. And they changed their diet. All right. Anyway, this is a diabetic we took care of. Here he is on medications. High blood sugars. Here's his blood sugar result. Again, these are typical results. Dropped his blood sugar from 300 down to normal just by changing his diet. Here he is 90 days later, and here he is now. And again, this is typical. You should expect these results. All right, I want to just divert to something a little bit different here for a minute. It's something that I know you've discussed in the conference, but I have great passion about. And I want to discuss it with you all. With all this information, there is no controversy in what I told you in terms of science. With all this information, we now live in a decade where people praise the lard. And they point the guilty finger solely at simple sugar, which, by the way, simple sugar is not a health food. Don't get me wrong. Rots teeth, raises triglycerides, creates nutritional imbalances. It's not health food. I gave you the Kempner example just to show you that simple sugar should be the focus of attention. It's not good for you, but it's not the problem. But that's where our whole attention is these days is on the sugar, right? It's all you hear about. In fact, there's a new movie out. I haven't seen it yet, but called Fed Up. Excuse me. They missed the elephant in the room. Yes, they did. They're telling you, they're telling you that just quit the sugar and you can keep the lard. That's what they say. How in the world did that happen? Well, with the low-carb diet teaching, which uh, probably the most famous person was Robert Atkins in low-carb eating. Low-carb eating means you eat meat, well, you eat bacon, brie, and butter. Yeah, that's it, the Atkins diet. And that's supposed to be health food. And it is still taught as being healthful. There's a whole segment of the population, in fact, sometimes I think they're winning, but I know they're not, who believes that these low-carb diets are good for you. You don't eat any starch. Well, they give you a few green and yellow vegetables just as an apology because they realize their diet is so dangerous. So they throw in a little kale. Low-carb diets. 
Low-carb diets can treat type 2 diabetes. If you feed somebody a low-carb diet, their diabetes will get better. Yes, it will. Why does it get better? Oh, well, it gets better because, well, not because they make them healthy. In fact, that's what people focus on is they help focus on blood sugar. You can make the blood sugar of a type 2 diabetic better by feeding them a low-carb diet. You can make them lose weight by feeding them a low-carb diet. You can do that. But do you make them healthier? No, you don't. And there's more to treating the diabetic than just making their sugar lower. You know, you got to make their heart healthy and their kidney healthy and so on. Do low-carb diets do that? I don't think they do. In fact, I'm pretty sure they don't. In fact, I wrote a little thing in uh, Mayo Clinic Proceedings a few years back about these low-carb diets. <clears throat> what I said uh, when I wrote to Mayo Clinic after they published the great results on a low-carb diet, how their blood sugars got better, how they lost weight, how their blood pressures got better, and they have bought all this stuff. And, and your friends and relatives and a lot of the... A lot of the common discussion is out there is, well, these low-carb diets are good. Not only do they cause you to lose weight, but they make your sugar down, your blood pressure, et cetera. What I wrote, which stands today in Mayo Clinics, is signs of improved health appear to accrue as measured by changes in a variety of risk factors like cholesterol, triglycerides, uric acid, glucose, blood pressure, and body weight. Hence, the patient is declared healthier. However, this is not necessarily a correct assessment. Similar benefits, for similar reasons, are seen when patients undergo cancer chemotherapy. Physicians do not brag about these results. Excuse me, these low-carb diets will get number changes by making your patients sick, not healthy. Do believe that. All right, we know, for example, a recent publication, the paleo diet increases cholesterol. Low-carb diets, as published by the people who pay for low-carb diets, the Atkins group here particularly, show that patients who are on these low-carb diets, they get constipated, headaches, halitosis, muscle cramps, diarrhea. And then there's this problem with uh, low-carb diets. In fact, it's discussed a lot since low-carb ketogenic diets are used to treat epilepsy in little children, which is a whole other issue. But the kids get kidney stones, as people do on these ketogenic diets. So, yeah, they will cause you to lose weight, and they will cause your numbers to change, but they don't make you healthier. They make you sicker. Plus, all major studies, no exceptions, all major studies show these low-carb diets. We're talking about the Atkins-type diet, where you can tend toward the traditional paleo-type diet. All studies published in major reviews, and I'll show you the three of them here, show that these diets increase risk of death and disease. Yep, they do. They showed it in the Annals of Internal Medicine in their review. The animal low-carb score was associated with a higher off-cause mortality. In the British Medical Journal, low-carbohydrate, high-protein diets used on a regular basis are associated with increased risk of cardiovascular disease. And Public Library of Science published low-carb diets were associated with a significant higher risk of all-cause mortality. These diets, they kill, and they make people sick. But it continues, and the popular press has bought into it. It, it just amazes me, as I said, I've been at this for almost 40 years, that people could actually buy into eating more meat, more eggs, more dairy was healthy. That's saturated fat. You know that saturated fat is meat, egg, and egg, dairy, and eggs, right? Okay, so what's the popular discussion out there? Eat more saturated fat. It's good for you. Yes, they say it is. Well, the guy who started this is a guy named Ron Krauss, and he deserves the honor that I'm going to give him right now. Ron Krauss, uh, UCSF adjunct professor, endocrinologist, and director of atherosclerosis research at Children's Hospital, he started all this. You should know this. I wrote a whole story about him, March 2014. If you go on Google and you you add in the term Ron Krauss, the third discussion up there is a discussion that I did about Ron Krauss, a whole newsletter which talked about Ron Krauss, the man who had made lard eating popular again. I call him Dr. Lard. He deserves the recognition. Now, in 1986, when he used to publish uh, research in the journals, he talked about how saturated fat was bad for the arteries and bad for people. Yes, he did. And then he got a job with the beef and dairy industry. Yes, he did. And guess what? Everything changed. And then in March 2010, he published the classic study in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition that's changed everything. A meta-analysis was seriously flawed. 
The editorial by Jeremiah Stanley that accompanied that article said, this is just bad medicine. <laughs> and the letters to the editor that followed up said, this is crooked. But it, it continued Ron Krause's work. And everything you hear about saturated fat being good for you, all the articles are based upon this one guy who works for the beef and the dairy industry, Ron Krause. I call him Dr. Lard. Look it up. Google Ronald Krause. Third article is about Dr. Lard. If you objected, you think you'd have said something that's been up for almost five months. He hasn't. All right, as a consequence of his work, we have articles published in the British Medical Journal that say saturated fat is not a major issue. Or in the New York Times, just a few months ago, what was that in, uh, what does that say? You can read it. April, Bar of this year. says, uh, study doubts saturated fats linked to heart disease. Flawed study, published in the Annals of Internal Medicine. Also based on Ron Krause's work. And then the Wall Street Journal came out with an article in March or May. Did it just hit you in the stomach when these things came out? These articles? Well, I want you to know where they come from. And then, how about last month? Oh, I thought when this appeared in Time Magazine, I really, I felt like they, they hit me below the belt and I, I wasn't going to recover my breath. It took me a little while to recover and realize what, I knew what was going on. I knew what was going on. It seems like sometimes we're just not going to win, doesn't it? Well, we, there was a little win that happened a couple days ago, and this was uh, in the Minneapolis Star Tribune. I'm not going to get into great detail, but the low carbers, the people who are writing these articles, they're picking on a guy called Ansel Keys, Dr. Ansel Keys. And you know what? They're not telling the truth, but they don't care. And I wrote, actually, I wrote the University of Minnesota. I asked him, why don't you come to the defense of Ansel Keys, the guy who developed K-rations, the man who's at the heart of the Mediterranean diet? Why don't you come to his defense? I wrote 19 of them at the beginning of this month. Well, two days ago, an article came out in the uh, Minnesota Star Tribune in defense of Ansel Keys. These people who are talking about how Ansel, I don't know why in the heck they would go there. But they are. They're not telling the truth. Anyway, the two most popular books out there now are knockoffs of the Atkins diet. They are, they are the Atkins diet. It's just that they don't sell them as the Atkins diet because nobody would buy a book titled Eat More Animals to Lose Weight. Nobody would do that. So how do you sell people the Atkins diet again? You call it wheat belly. If you eat wheat, you get a big belly, right? Or you call it gray brain. If you eat grains, your brain will deteriorate, and what could be worse than that? Excuse me, you read these books. These are Atkins knockoffs. All right, so they have you all convinced you're not supposed to eat grains, you're not supposed to eat starch. Nobody's supposed to eat these things, right? Isn't that what all your friends are telling you? Don't that bother you terribly? Well, I put together a little piece that may help you. You get it. Excuse me, ladies and gentlemen, this is with the help of Jeff Nelson that we put this together. Excuse me, ladies and gentlemen, you know what the truth is. Stop the liars. Stop the polluters. Stop the cheaters. They're not only destroying your patient's health, they're destroying the future. It has to be stopped. Now, when it comes to name calling, you want to call me a name? Go ahead. I'd be happy to know it be known as Dr. Potato, Dr. Vegetable, etc. Can I have the next presentation? <clears throat> I, I, I want to tell you, I've gotten very frustrated with trying to help people to change after 40 years. But the thing that keeps me going, just like you, is sometimes somebody listens. And all of a sudden, their whole life has changed. They lose the weight, the diabetes goes away, the constipation stops. Everything's what well, you've seen it. And that's what keeps you trying. My son is a board-certified internist at Kaiser. He says to me, because he gets a little frustrated, he says, son, they don't care. I don't believe that. I think it, people care. I see, I walk down the street, I see uh, young women who are overweight and hardly can get down the street, and I say to myself, boy, if they just ever knew how simple it was, they would do it because they care. Or uh, say a, a young man who dies of heart disease and leaves his family. And that family cares. I think people really do care. They just don't understand what to do and how to do it. So I put together Dr. McDougall's picture book, color picture book. I put it together last month, and I put it on my website, and we so far have it tra translated into Spanish, Greek, and French. 
and we're going to get it translated into as many languages as possible. Let me show you the, the, uh, the version. Uh, this is Dr. McDougall's color picture book on food poisoning. Ladies and gentlemen, this is food poisoning that's going on. You can't look at it any other way. If you do, you miss the importance and you miss the solution. This is food poisoning and it can be solved. All right, some of the slides are working. All right. Can anybody hit the next slide? What do you think? All right. If we can't get it working, what we'll do is we'll do other questions. Anyway, I put together this color picture book, and let me just tell you what, it, uh, what happens with this book. First thing, okay, first thing about the color picture book that I want to tell you about is you can't treat uh, dietary change with moderation. It doesn't work. It's like an, asking a cigarette smoker to cut down. It doesn't work. Or an alcoholic to sober up by switching to beer and wine. It never works. It's the same thing about people dying of food poisoning. You can't say eat a little chicken or just a small portion. It doesn't work. You can't do that. They just need to say no. But they have to know what to say no to. And what is like clean air and clean liquid like as opposed to tobacco and alcohol. They have to have a clear distinction. So what clean is, is starches, vegetables, and fruits, and what is dirty is animal foods and oils. They have to think that way and just stop it. Uh, the diet that I teach is based on starches, vegetables, and fruits. It has no animal foods and no oils. Use a little salt, sugar, and spice. It's based on starch. You must get that starch part in there or you will starve to death. It has a little bit of non-starchy vegetable, like broccoli, cauliflower, and sprouts. If you try and live on that, you'll starve to death. It has a little fruit. Fruits are fine. They're not very appetite satisfying for a long time. You don't eat this. This is not food. People are sick because they eat rich foods. They eat like kings and queens. What would you expect if people ate at Burger King and Dairy Queen and ate Imperial Margarine? Would you expect them to be fat and have gout and be sick? I would. So this is food poisoning, okay? This is food poisoning. This is serious. Food poisoning. Food poisoning. Food poisoning. Okay, so the way you fix it is you stop the food poisons, which are the animal foods and the oils in general. And the benefits happen quickly. People notice the benefit in like a day. The balls start feeling better. The greasy skin starts getting better. And then in seven days, I told you the results. And in four months, most of the problems due to chronic food poisoning are gone. Uh, this is not important, but one of the early scientific control trials on this was published in Daniel. Okay, let's just go on. Gladiators, as I showed you, they lived on a starch-based diet, barley and beans. So to cure food poisoning, you do following. You don't eat. You don't eat. Fake meats, you know, the vegetarian foods, like fake cheese, fake burgers, those are not good for you. Okay, now the reason the food people get away with this is because of false advertising. They say if you don't eat their products, you'll get protein and calcium deficiency, but that's never been reported. There's no such thing. And if you don't eat fish, you'll get omega-3 fatty acid deficiency. Well, no fish ever made an omega-3 fat. Where does this come from? It's called false advertising. And what you need to do is eat a starch-based diet. So this is how you cure food poisoning. You eat lots of the following.
You have to be careful about the uh, even natural soy products like tofu. They're, they're soy milk, and they're, they're kind of rich, so be careful with those things. The problem is, is people who try to be vegetarian, they go to nuts and seeds and these fake or these soy products, they end up being fat vegans, and they don't accomplish their goal. Don't take supplements, they're dangerous. Yes, they are. You know that. You might want to take a little B12. You want to be careful about getting sunshine, not too much, but not too little, and exercise likewise. And one last thought, and I'll have to end with this. I know Neil asked me to save time for questions. I didn't. I'm sorry. But one last thing is if you don't care about yourself, and I know you do, think about the future. Think about the planet. Half the greenhouse gases come from the livestock industry. It is the, if not one of the major sources of pollution. And the nice thing is, is about food. We can change that today. Yes, we can today. I mean, transportation may take 10, 20 years to get that fixed, and energy needs 10, 20 years. But if all of us decided today we were going to stop the food poisoning, we could change the world today. I think we can. I would like to. And I'd like your help. Thank you very much.